I am so excited to be doing this Next Level podcast episode from Nextiva because Colin Taylor is here with us, and Colin Taylor is a legendary expert, subject matter expert, and consultant on contact centers and on both the customer experience and the agent experience. How are you doing, Colin? Mike, I'm doing really well. It's a pleasure to be here today and uh, looking forward to our discussion. Should be a lot of fun. Oh, fantastic. So Colin's name is Colin Taylor. However, his company is named Taylor Reach. Uh, Colin, can you tell us what in the world Taylor Reach is and what it does? Well, the Taylor Reach Group is a call, a contact center, and customer experience consulting firm. Uh, we, we help our clients achieve their contact center and customer experience goals, whatever those may be. So if it's improving productivity, if it's improving quality, if it's selecting new technology, um, we're, we're the pe people that they call. So uh, it also happens to be a body of water outside of a cottage I used to own. It was labeled on the maps as Taylor Reach, and uh, I just like that, so... Well, it sounds very spiffy. So Colin, traveling all over the world as well as uh, in North America where we both live, any interesting uh, situations that have come up when you've been uh, assisting a customer? Oh, we've we've had all kinds of, uh, of interesting situations, uh, Micah, from, you know, for, from folks phoning in for technical support, um, you know, who, you know, who, who literally you know, didn't have a computer, but wanted to ask us what computer had the least amount of issues. So they were phoning the computer help desk for all these no. companies. I thought that was brilliant. I don't think it helped them at all, but it made for, for some interesting, uh, interesting discussions. <laughs> um, we did have, back, you know, the, the, you know, I, I'm dating myself, but then nobody else will date me. So uh, back in the day, we did have oh, a caller. But everybody, I'm he is in Toronto. <laughs> His last name is Taylor. It's not Reach. It's T-A-Y. L O R, and apparently he is an eligible bachelor. Carry on. <laughs> we uh, we did ha have a uh, customer back in the day. Uh, this would be long before many of the listeners, I'm sure, were alive. But the load drawer on their uh, computer was broken. It was actually their CD uh, load drawer. They thought it was a cup holder. So uh, that, without a word of a lie, is a true story. Um, we've we 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 had all kinds of really exciting calls when I was running the BPO when we ran the Puppy Birthday Club for. Uh, for Ralston Purina, we would have all Welcome these little BPO. Uh, business process outsourcers. So an outsourcing agency that handles calls or contacts on behalf of a client organization that uh, doesn't wish to do it themselves. So, um, you know, when I was running the, the BPO, we handled the puppy birthday line for Ralston Purina, which basically was was just a brilliant marketing, oh, traditional marketing, not the new marketing. Uh, uh -huh. a approach where they encourage people to call in and register their puppy's birthday and then you know and then on and then they'd get a welcome package with coupons and then on their birthday they'd get a card you know happy birthday rover you know <laughs> you know with coupons and you know you know but but we but we'd have all these little kids calling in to you know like seven eight year olds calling in to to register their birthdays and we had more than a few who also said, can I register my birthday too so I can get a card and, you know, for, for, from you on my birthday? So so uh, we think we did a pretty good job. I don't think we registered terribly many children who got kibbled coupons or anything uh, for, for that, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> A lot of fun. All right, that's a great story, and I want yeah. I I want to register my puppies. That's really <laughs> cool. Can you tell me about the agent experience? We hear a lot about dissatisfaction for people working in large contact centers, like you've been discussing, and also in smaller and mid-sized telephone-based operations. Are there some secrets of keeping employees happy? Yeah, I, I think that we've all been reading about the great resignation of uh, of late, and you know, I think that really is just you know demonstrating the fact that agents aren't happy. Engagement scores have been going down throughout the pandemic. You know, once everyone got over the the happy factor of working at home and not having to commute, um, you know, they started to see issues with, with absenteeism and tardiness. Like, how can you run late getting from the bedroom to 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 the kitchen table to do your work? I don't know, but uh, people could. Oh, you can do it. I get it. <laughs> You, you and I both, my friend. But at the end of the day, I, I think that, you know, a lot of organizations weren't really equipped to have their staff work from home. While they might have had the technology to get them there, 
they didn't really have the tools, processes, or procedures to manage them effectively. So a lot of people felt sort of abandoned. They felt like they're out on their own. They weren't getting the support they were used to. There used to be somebody on either side of them they could turn to and say, hey, do you know how to do this? Or what was that answer oh, yeah. to that question? That's all gone, right? You know, they're, you know, their supervisors, they used to be able to just put up their hand or, you know, or, you know, or flag somebody down, you know, in the hall, you know, or in the aisle. Uh, they can't do that either. Now everything's going on, on a chat which may or may not get you the right answer and may or may not be attended to promptly by, by the team leader supervisor. So, so, so I think there's a lot of angst uh, in there, but I think at the end of the day, if we respect our staff, if we treat them well, if we pay them fairly um, and we create a positive culture, then I think folks stay. I think that's true regardless of whether we're talking about agents or, or any other kind of position in the organization. Absolutely. So, so bosses out there, just, just think about it. The customers, aren't allowed to yell at their kids. Well, I don't know about allowed, but they try not to yell at their kids. They try not to kick their dog. They try not to yell at their spouse. And then they get on the phone with one of our agents and maybe they do use this as an opportunity to vent. Now, I have techniques for how to work with such a customer and I know Colin does as well. But think about the uh, toll at the end of the day on your agents, right? Mm -hmm. So they can handle it if they're good at their job and if they've been properly trained. But it's a lot more disheartening if they're also getting beaten down on the internal side. So mm -hmm. you got to love them up for this and you got to uh, tangibly love them up with good pay and good benefits. Otherwise, first of all, what's the point of being in business? And also you're going to have some astounding turnover. No, exactly. I, I would agree 100%, Mike. I, I think that, you know, that, you know, you know, we, you know, we're, we're going to deal with, you know, emotional customers, you know, uh, there will be people who oh, yeah, will yeah. be upset and, you know, and they will take it out and they will vent on the person they're, 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 they're speaking with. Um, and, you know, and yes, we do need to train them how to deal with emotional customers. We need the train the trainee agents, how to deescalate situations. We need to train them how to recover from that sort of, you know, you know, you know, mental beating that they just took so that they can get back on the call and still have a positive outlook and a smile in their voice, if you will. Uh, but, you know, it's, it, you know, it, we, we need to, we need to, to, to love and nurture the agents if we expect them to, to be able to do the job we, we've, we've placed, you know, we've placed them in and to exercise the trust we're assigning them to. You know, it, it always amazes me that we're, you know, that, that we're, we're using the company's lowest paid staff, generally speaking, to look after their most valuable resource, their, their customers. Um, and, you know, and failing to, to support them in doing that is just a recipe for customer attrition and for, you know, complaints about the business and lower NPS scores and churn, uh, none of which are objectives for any of the organizations. And the easiest way to combat that is, is to treat their staff well. So you brought up something and I want to go with that. So a lot of our listeners don't have huge contact centers and don't know what metrics to look at. And they've heard a lot of, uh, well, I wouldn't say conflicting advice, but they've heard a lot of kind of cliched advice. Can you tell us what matters? Like, is first call resolution the most important thing? Well, I, I think the first contact re resolution is, is a very important and key metric you know we want to resolve the issues you know now the question is is is, is it resolved just because we think it is or is it resolved because the customer actually you know is able to to resolve their their issue um you know lots of organizations will track whether or not the agent thinks they resolve the issue and okay. some it's even defaulted as soon as you handle the call you resolve the issue it's like magic it doesn't really work that way but it looks re really good on the report you know and and others will ask the customer as they're exiting the interaction did we resolve your issue well, the customer may feel it's resolved, but if what they think was going to happen doesn't actually occur, the issue isn't <laughs> resolved either. The only really true measure is whether or not they ever contact you back within a reasonable period of time about the same issue. So if you start looking at recontact, you know, you know, 48 or 72 hours after the initial contact, you can get a much better perspective on what your true first contact re resolution is. Uh, but, you know, on the, you know, on the broader topic of metrics, there's agent metrics, there's center metrics and team metrics, and they're not all, you know, applicable to, to everyone. 
agents don't control the volume, you know, the, the, what the demand is, the number of contacts, and they don't control how many agents you staffed in the center for that shift or that day. So to hold them, to try and hold them accountable for service level or average speed of answer is ridiculous. It's outside of their control, but centers still do that. You know, the, the other metric that, that, that managers seem to always want to sort of, you know, focus on is, you know, handle time. You know, at the oh, end of the day, you know, a call needs to be as long as a call needs to be to to deliver whatever information. Has Amen. To be conveyed, you know, and to sit there and arbitrarily say, yes, but that's two minutes or that's three minutes doesn't make any sense. And to try and hold folks accountable to those metrics uh, or even to try, as one of our clients did, to, impl to implement an incentive program, try and drive down that that call length because they knew that it was just the agents chit chatting and that, you know, and if we give them an incentive, they'll stop doing that. Um, they actually created a contest. And every time an agent had a call under three minutes, they got their name entered in the contest for some nice prizes. And the initial results were very encouraging. You know, average handle time went down. At the same time, though, they noticed that call volume seemed to be going up. And then the quality guys are saying, yep, <laughs> we seem to be hanging up on callers. You know? so, the unintended consequence was, yes, they got shorter handle time, but they tell the customers, you're going to have to hang up and call back now because your three minutes are up. And they'd hang up the phone and disconnect the caller. So um, you know, you know, for handle time and average handle time, you really need to manage against the outliers. Both those callers, you know, that, that are outside of a 10 or 15 percent band around what you think an ideal handle time is, you know, but the ones that are too long, obviously, maybe they're having trouble finding the right information. Maybe they've got sidetracked. Maybe they've lost control of the call. Regardless, any of those areas are things that we can help through coaching. So we want to look at those. The folks who are doing it in record time, you know, that, that is shorter than the expected bandwidth, they probably have issues, too. Either they're not. Uh, you know, they're, they're not properly explaining it. They're giving the wrong answer to the question, uh, both of which are going to drive, you know, down first contact resolution and customer satisfaction. Um, or they're rushing through things or they're not actually checking with the customer that this actually is relevant, um, all of which we want to coach to. So we really want to coach the outliers and, and leave sort of the messy middle alone because, you know, calls need to be as long as they need to be. I like that, the messy middle. Yeah, another thing about the very short ones, uh, let me just throw this out, is that uh, it may be that our self-service tools weren't functioning or were hard to find because those might be things that I wouldn't want to force the customer to use self-service, but they might actually prefer to. Now, we have discussed an interesting example, which is uh, Zappos trying to increase the length of the average call. And... I'm not saying everyone wants to do that, but they use mm -hmm. it as their big sales tool. Their theory is that mostly they are an e-commerce company, but every so often, somewhere in the course of the customer's lifetime uh, relationship with the company, they're going to call in. And on that call, they want to have it be spectacular. Now, we've discussed how Zappos is able to do this, and this is by building in breathing space to their seat um, metric. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Well, the, the you know. Seat occupancy is what yeah, the word I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah. Um, Zappos famously has sort of said at one point in time that they didn't have any contact center metrics. And what they really meant was that they don't hold their agents accountable for, for achieving certain metrics. Clearly, they have to look at the metrics. They didn't know how many calls are coming in. They need to look at how long calls are on average in order to do any kind of forecasting. But, but once they get to that number of how many people I need to handle the expected volume, they actually ratchet that occupancy, you know, that, that gives them an occupancy level and they ratchet that down. And they do that to allow some calls to go longer, uh, knowing that they're from time to time, there is going to be the need to spend more time with a caller to, uh, okay, so to solve their problem. Thinking, people listening to this are going to think a higher occupancy would mean there's more people to answer the calls, but it's the opposite, right? Well, higher occupancy simply means that more of the agent's time is being spent serving a customer. So typically, you know, for, you know. So it's how much the agents are occupied. And correct. the less they're occupied, the more variability is possible. Correct. Correct. The, the, the lower the occupancy, the more time they have available to do stuff. Now that stuff can be answering, you know, you know, you know, non non live inquiries like emails or you know or near live inquiries like chat. It could be doing coaching. It could be reading a, the new knowledge article, or it can simply be be built in as a buffer. 
to allow you to have 15 minute calls, even though normally you only have five minute calls. Exactly. And, and or a 10 hour call as they famously slash infamously did. Once. Correct. Yes. Okay, so, yeah. so basically if you want to grow your business through your telephone operation, whether you call it a contact center or not, then I'm going to argue, and Zappo certainly would argue, that you need to allow time for more personable calls. For the dog barks and you're like, oh, what kind of dog do you have? And so mm -hmm. forth, and you bond over it. Mm -hmm. Or my favorite example was I was at Zappos and this agent was talking with a much, much older customer. I think she was a great grandmother and she had a wedding of a, a much younger uh, family member coming up. And the customer was really upset because she had ordered two pairs of narrow shoes and narrows which was her size mm -hmm. and they looked good but they were very uncomfortable and she was just really leery or even despondent about what that day was going to be like on her feet all day so madison zeroed in not on that there was a dog barking or a kid crying or whatever the thing was that you could like stereotypically bond with a customer she heard the most important word in the conversation which was narrows and she said honestly ma'am narrows are the worst it's almost like this whole shoe industry has conspired against customers with narrow feet my aunt has narrow feet like you and i swear every other time we're talking it's about her miseries related to her narrow feet so you could hear the customer sigh with relief oh someone finally gets me and then after she had calmed down madison and the customer were able to co-browse and find a couple more pairs that were both in narrow and had some uh some potential for not being a total torture fest for a day spent on their feet. But think about it as you, when you are a small, small company, you do this stuff naturally. You only have a couple clients and you can spend the time getting them what they need. And then as you grow, you think, well, you know, these big companies, they must know something I don't know. So you try to get your FCR, your first contact resolution numbers down. But really, that's not exactly the way to go. What Colin is saying is, in the middle is probably the right place to be uh, because the short calls may not be going right and the long calls may not be going right. Um, what I would say is those long calls actually may have some value as well. Let's talk for a second about messaging. I did some, uh, right, right when uh, T-Mobile introduced messaging, it was wildly successful. They didn't tell anyone about it. They just had a little uh, button on their app in magenta, of course, that said, message me. And some astounding percentage of customers did that without any marketing or anything. And they enjoyed the asynchronous, um, the async, we pretend that messaging is real time, but it's almost real time, which seems to be perfect for customers because they can do something, they can, uh, you know, they text their message and then they'll do something else and then the agent will respond and so forth. And the agents also seem to like it as well because they could build these uh, longer term relationships with the customers because the way the T-Mobile system is set up, you can continue to get the same agent. Are you seeing customers liking this? Or yeah, does it I, depend on the demographic or what are no, you seeing? I, I think the text messaging you know, is... Uh... Um, it is a popular channel. In a lot of ways, it's like an unstructured chat. So, you know, if you think about a, a live chat session, it really is. It, it's just each one of those, you know, um, messages is, 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 is separate. And, you know, the system puts them together in a, uh, you know, in a uh, uh, sequence and, you know, and a framework that the agent can, can I can give a little with. plug for our sponsor here? So if you're using NextOS, uh, the, the wonderful software from Nextiva, you will see all of this uh, in one spot, so it's very handy for the agent. Sorry, carry yeah. on. No, and, and and that's what the best the, the best of breed solutions have is they have that that ability to 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 frame it so it's easy for the agent to work with and to see the the, the previous legs of, of that interaction. Um, but it's you know it's 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 powerful. Uh, you know the the danger that most organizations have had is there can be long pauses in there, and that has meant it can be difficult to get it to the same agent which is ideally where you want it to go. So you don't have to start again at the beginning. So, so, so the ability to have, to have that uh, continuity of agent connection, the ability to see everything in one place dramatically enhances the value and utility of, of that communication channel over its predecessor, which was chat. Absolutely. And let me just throw this out as well. 
uh, agents, when you are given the ability to do this stuff on your own phone, please don't do it when you're driving. The boss doesn't want you to crash your car, I don't think. And if they do, get a new boss. Okay, so before I let you go, how about some tips for companies trying to manage their own contact center, even if they don't call it that, even if mm -hmm. it's just, you know, mom and pop or mom and mom or pop and pop running a little store but talking on the phone. Anything like, you know, be ready for the call. Don't sound like you're being interrupted. Anything along those lines. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Don't say, what do you want? As you answer the call, that's usually a good starting point. But <laughs> wait, wait, can I interrupt you for a second, Colin? Yeah. So I have this great uh, employee. She's, she was wonderful. Her name's Eileen. I can give her a real name because she's so great. So we, she had this joke that she, which was when she knew it was me calling the phone, I was her boss. She'd go, what? <laughs> and of course, you know, inevitably where the story is going. One yeah. morning, very sheepishly, she confessed to me. She did that to a customer because she thought it was me. Sorry. Carry on. <laughs> No, it you know you 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 spoke a moment ago, Mike, about, about Zappos, and Zappos really, you know, defines himself as a relationship center. You know, they really want every interaction to build a relationship, and that's a great objective for any small call center or small organization. You know, we are there to help our customers. We are the native guides. We know how to navigate our systems and the processes. You know, we're like the caddy at the golf course that knows the lay of the land and which way the greens break. That is what agents can do, and agents who are well trained and um, who are you know well treated and you know and well coached and well managed are really going to be that assistant to the customer to get done what they need to get done. And doing that, you're going to find that things are going to turn uh, a lot on empathy and compassion around dealing with customer issues. Uh, but really, we just need to, 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 to focus on one customer, one interaction at a time, and we need to do the best we can to help them get to their goal. And if we do that every time, we're going to have happy customers who are going to stay loyal to the organization, and we'll see repurchase go up and word of mouth go up, and wonderful things can happen. Absolutely. As I love to say, customer service is the new marketing, and you'll be amazed how well it works because... The old marketing you, you ha is great as well, but you have to keep funneling money into it with the word of mouth marketing, or as I like to call it, word of thumb when it's on a mobile device. It can grow and grow. Well, thank you so much, Colin Taylor. His company is Taylor Reach. Oh, not like a tailor who sews your suit, but the other kind. <laughs> T-A-Y-L-O-R, Reach, R-E-A-C-H. Thank you again, Colin. Mike, it's been my pleasure. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you.